here it is, Echo Foam Mechanical Exist. I have no disclosures. And uh, we will talk about the Echo in the perioperative scenario. So that means how we can assess cardiac abnormalities that could lead to postoperative complications, how we can evaluate the surgical result, and how we can maybe determine the reasons for postoperative hemodynamic compromise in patients with ventricular assist device. I think every one of you knows that uh, the most used assist device are the left ventricle, so right ventricular assist device is rarely there, and biventricular also. And uh, you can also divide them in long-term or short-term support. So long-term support means that uh, you implant really intracorporal pumps designed to improve the durability and to decrease, decrease the device-related adverse events while providing good mobility so the patients can walk around, can go swimming or whatever, improving functional status and quality of life. And this is meant for bridge to transplantation, but more and more as a destination therapy because uh, we have a huge lack of organ donors, at least in Germany. And then you have the short-term support, which means an acute support after patient resuscitation or failure to wean from cardiopulmonary bypass to bridge the patient until you find a decision if you implant a ventricular assist device or if you go for termination of the therapy. So there are a lot of mechanical assist systems on the market. These pulsatile flow pumps are less implanted nowadays. I don't know how the, the relation is in UK as well. So you go for the pulsatile, non-pulsatile, so the heart-made and the hardware system. The artificial heart is also very rare. So uh, we implant around 80 watts a year and we have done only one, one uh, artificial heart with not a good result. And then this for the short-term results, it's an ECMO, more or less. So what do we have to, to assess with ECHO? One is either if it's pre-implantation or after implantation on the ICU, we have to look for thrombotic material whenever, whenever something goes wrong. So in the apex, that is most important for the position of the inflow graft, or in any cardiac cavity if there is a pump flow disturbance in, on the ICU. We have to assess the ascending aorta for aneurysm or atherosclerosis for positioning of the outflow graft. We have to look for mitral stenosis because that will impede the, the inflow into the left ventricle, of course. We have to look for aortic regurgitation. There, there is some change in, in the management. We will go into that in a few minutes. And we have to, to uh, look if it's not really well known to to uh, explant the mechanical aortic procedures because uh, mechanical procedures and elvet means that you will have a fixed open position and then you will have a vicious circle uh, circulation in the elvet. We have to look for shunts either on atrial or PFU or ventricular level and we have to look for ventricular interdependence and last not least that is the most uh, difficult question how we deal with the right ventricle and that thanks. So we go to that. So what is really good to see pre-implantation, you see that huge thrombus formation, which is very fl flat, or this localized thrombus formation. So this you have to know to deal with the, with the uh, ideal puncture side. If in any situation after implantation of the LVAD, something happened that the LVAD doesn't function anymore. Then you have to look, as I mentioned before, either for thrombus formation or maybe for sludge. This is a patient who was uh, three weeks on LVAD, and you see that here, that there's a lot of sludge there. That often occurs when the aortic valve, the natic aortic valve, does not open again. So you can avoid that by um, um, manipulating your 
ventricle assist device in that way that it's not fully unloaded the left ventricle so that the aortic valve opens a little bit, that the left ventricle ejects. That is enough, that we know that from a lot of experience, a lot of studies, that you don't have to completely unload the left ventricle in order to get it better. And if you unload it, you can end up with such a sludge phenomenon and with cerebral events, and we know all that we have 15% cerebral events each year in patients with a ventricle assist device due to clotting and everything. For positioning of the inflow cannula, I think 3D multiple plane reconstruction is really very, very helpful because you have the four jam of view and you have the two jam of view and you can really guide the surgeon to get an optimal position. And an optimal position of the inflow cannula will ensure that post-operatively you will have hopefully not so much problems. So what is an, a good uh, position? A good uh, position of the inflow cannula is that your inflow looks really, is directed to the mitral valve. And if you put color flow in, you see that here, it's nicely flow into the inflow cannula. And if there's no disturbances with the color flow, you see nearly no elising phenomenon. And if you put CV Doppler in, you have around one meter. Normal parameters for the inflow as well as for the outflow cannula is around one to two meters per second. Every acceleration of that flow means that either there's thrombotic material in the system or uh, the inflow cannula is kinked or whatever. So you have to think about that. But every, each flow in the normal range between one and two meters per second is a normal thing. You see that here, once again, without color. So an optimal position is when the opening is directed to the mitral valve so that the inflow is without any disturbance. This is a suboptimal position because here the cannula is directed to the septum. In that case now, it doesn't make any difference. But if the left ventricle is a little bit too much unloaded, then the inflow is disturbed because the septum will come to the inflow cannula. So you should avoid this position. You also can assess the outflow cannula very nicely, and you see here the outflow graft into the aortic ascending aorta, and again, you can do that also with color. And here you see the right coronary artery. So when you see with that with your assist device, you get a good um, flow into the right coronary artery as well. There's no steel phenomenon. Uh, and as I pointed out, you have a normal range between one and two meters per second. So that is really fine. Again, you can apply continuous wave doubler. An issue which was, um, at least we did aggressively treat, was patients with aortic regurgitation. And uh, you did it as well. It's, it's now, if you look at the, the newest literature, it's a matter of debate if you really have to treat that. The thing is, of course, if you have a moderate or severe aortic regurgitation, then you should address that. And why should you address that? Because if you have really a huge backflow, then you have a risk of getting a vicious circle with the aortic regurgitation, so that most of your cardiac output will just circulate from the ascending aorta to the left ventricle and and again and again. So that is not really very helpful. But this publication from end of last year where they looked at uh, 166 patients over a three years period, no longer, five years, six years period, um, they looked at the development of aortic regurg uh, during alveolar assist. And you see that here, here at the start. And a lot of patients will develop aortic insufficiency throughout their course when they have a, an LVAT. And the question is, do you have to address that or can you leave it? And uh, if you look, that is the freedom for aortic insufficiency. And as I told you, after two years, you have a lot of patients, at least one third, with moderate aortic insufficiency. And what they have found that the, this does not make any difference. 
Zoologic insufficiency in the cores of the alvet, at least up to five, six years, doesn't harm the patient. So 33% per, uh, of the patients develop that within two years, and the systolic blood pressure has no significant effect on this progression. But the pump speed and the excessive left ventricular offloading that increase the, the occurrence of aortic insufficiency. But as I mentioned, overall, the survival was identically in those patients who uh, have developed the aortic regurgitation uh, in contrast to that patients without aortic insufficiency. So maybe we should reconsider that. Any kind of shunting you should detect uh, with this ASD or PFO because this was in this patient, it preoperatively, it was not really visible. With unloading of the left ventricle, uh, immediately after start of the element, we could find that. And that, again, will lead to a right to left shunt. Also, in this kind of patient, this is a patient with a, a young patient after myocardial infarction and a ventricular septum defect which was put on, on ECMO first, and then a complete, uh, an, an element, because the ECMO uh, was there for four days, and then we decided to put him uh, on the element. And you see that without addressing the ventricular uh, uh, septum defect, the suctioning of the element on the left ventricle will cause a huge right to left change and then you will have problems with oxygenation and everything. So you have to rule out any kind of shunt, which, as I pointed out, can also um, occur after uh, implantation of that L1. Oops, what happens now? The next thing, uh, what we have to have in mind, especially then in the ICU, is the ventricular interdependence. So that means everyone knows of you knows that. That is the normal left ventricle. And if you look at the right ventricle, the free wall of the right ventricle needs the ventricular septum as a counterpart. If this ventricular septum is not acting as a counterpart, then the right ventricle will fail. And that will last several minutes. That is very, comes very, very quickly. So we have to have that in mind, that just to have the LVET in place and to increase the cardiac output does not mean that with every increase in cardiac output, the patient gets better. If you do it, if you unload the patient too much, like in that case, you see that here? The perfusionist was very happy and the intensive care doctor also, because he could increase the cardiac output and the lactate, and, and he, he did that. And he doesn't need, uh, and it, not so much uh, volume to do that, and he was very happy. But then suddenly the patient uh, failed, and you see that the right ventricle here failed. Formerly it was a good right ventricle. But now with that septum shift to the left, you cannot deal with that right ventricle failure ph pharmacological. The only thing what you should do is reduce the pump flow. And then within minutes, if you are not too late, the right ventricle will recover. So have that in mind. An optimal pump flow for the left ventricle is <clears throat> that the ventricular septum is not shifting to the left. So it should be at least straight. That is a good way to do. Not to unload the, uh, the uh, ventricle. The other upside of this metal is if you are unable to unload the left ventricle, like that point. So you have the cannula in mind, you have no intervention or, or disturbance with the septum or anterior wall or whatever, but you don't have so much flow because of obstruction. So that was a patient with thrombus and <clears throat> you could not manage to increase the, the pump flow. This happens in a patient with a PFO and a 
uh, left ventricular assist where the nurse gets in a little bit uh, a, a bolus injection and then the left ventricle the, the left atrium comes full of air and that as you can see it here immediately goes to the right ventricle and may cause right ventricular failure the same if you start the alvet you have really to be very careful that the left ventricle is completely de air because otherwise you will have problems with the right ventricle as well immediately after start and that is the major problem in all the alvet and at least we in leipzig we don't have a clue how we can predict right ventricular failure and if you look in the literature it's it's really hard to to define predictors for right ventricular failure after only um, left ventricular assist device implantation. One thing you can do is, of course, the TAPSI, and these two patients, that is very clear. In that patient with TAPSI of 2.7, you go straight ahead for, for an LVAT. In that patient with a TAPSI of 0.8, you really consider the, the RVAT as well, because uh, that is really a high-risk patient for right ventricular failure. Oops. So, <clears throat> and this is a patient pre-op and, of course, a clear indication for biventricular assist device. So this right ventricle doesn't move a lot, a lot, and that is no question. So, but what is this patient? We implanted the Nelvet, the RV function was well, and then in the ICU, we were called and put the echo in. So what would you do in that patient? So if you look at the septum, the septum is quite good. What would your option? So if you look at the right ventricle, it's really bad. Would you, would you go for, a, for a really for an ARVAT immediately, or, or would you go for, <clears throat> let's say, an ECMO to, to, to bridge, to, decim to, bridge to, to uh, really final decide what to do? We always cut an oxy into the right side of the knee. OK. So w what we did, we, we um, really put in an ECMO. For four days, here you see the patient immediately after ECMO implantation, and then after four days he recovered and we could explain that. So, because we know that patients with biventricular assist device have a huge risk of having adverse events, so everyone try to avoid these biventricular things. But the right ventricle is really hard to deal with, and you have to day to to. Be very, very careful in the first one or two weeks uh, in order that the right ventricle really um, adapts to that different situation. And in that case, TOE in that pay, or like Fabio would do it, the transthoracic, is just, you can do it as well with transthoracic. You, you do not need a transesophageal echo to, to deal with these situations. What I love to do in these patients, additionally to echo, is to use a pulmonary artery catheter with two pressures. So you, you see that here, the brown one here, that is the right ventricular pressure, and the, the yellow one is the pulmonary artery pressure. So there are pulmonary catheters out where you can do that. And I love that in these patients, because you see the difference between the diastolic pulmonary artery pressure and the right ventricular and diastolic pressure. And that is, these two pressures are coupled together. So one pressure measurement alone doesn't mean anything because uh, that you can have with different situations. But two pressures that are dependent, that gives you a good impression. So this was not a, an Alvet candidate, of course. As you see it, the, the uh, Arterial pressure was good, central venous pressure was good. That was fine. That was a patient undergoing tricuspid uh, repair, but uh, it was a huge uh, tricuspid regurgitation. And that was immediately after repair. 
So also a patient with right ventricular failure. And uh, then after 15 minutes, I think it was 15 minutes, yeah, 16, 11, 16. So you see 11.32, I was called because the patient uh, was uh, getting worse and worse. And what you see, what happened is that there was much, something happened to the right ventricle, let's say it this way, because the difference between the diastolic pulmonary artery pressure, whoops, and the right ventricle and diastolic pressure was, is less. Huh? Here it is, the difference is 12, here it's just four. And you see that the, pulmonary, the peak pulmonary artery pressure has also decreased. So the right ventricle has got worse and worse. And unfortunately, the, the anesthesiologist hasn't realized that in these 12 minutes. So uh, he, had, he has used this rapid infusion system because he thought the patient was bleeding and he put, has put a lot of volume in, too much in these short times. And, but with these two pressures together, you can really titrate that. And together with the echo, you can really titrate uh, the volume situation and you can treat the right ventricle even in patients with a moderate or a bad right ventricular function undergoing LVAD implantation. So the practice points to come to my conclusions are right ventricular failure is really hard to predict and you should look at the hemodynamic echo, the echocardiographic parameters together with clinical variables. Took that all together. Right ventricle ballooning leftward shift or interventricle septum, of the, of the interventricle septum, and high PA pressures, you just need for RV assist. If the high PA pressures decrease over time without making the situation better, then the RV failure is even worse because the right ventricle is not able, no longer able to create these high pulmonary artery pressures. Low pump flow may result from hypovolemia. This you can rule out with echo very nicely. Are we failure also with echo or with this pulmonary artery catheter or inflow cannula obstruction? And any alvad malfunction should lead to echocardiographic assessment to look for obstruction of the cannula or thrombotic material in any heart chambers or pericardial tamponade. Thank you very much.